today i have a dear friend of mine uh he's written a book i think it's catching you know in art of living a lot of us are writing books <laughs> yes <laughs> and uh, his i knew him as alex now he is called swami purna chaitanya which is quite a mouthful uh so if i call him alex here and there i'm sure he won't mind and i'm sure you won't mind uh i met alex at the german ashram the first time mm. yes and uh, they were doing the guru puja course over there and as you can see alex is a very white guy right <laughs> totally <laughs> and uh, his pronunciation of the guru puja sometimes i felt was actually better than mine <laughs> and there was a bit of insecurity there <laughs> and the next thing i knew was uh, he was here in the in the bangalore ashram and and uh, now he is a full on swami ji and he chants the rudra puja and uh, Uh, you know he does all the things that swami ji's do and right? still white and 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 yeah and and he and he wears white uh but that has not taken away his sense of humor his sense of mischief and his sense of fun and uh, today i'm just going to talk to him about his new book looking inwards yeah meditating to survive in a changing world so swami ji yes <laughs> why did you write this book why i wrote this book to be very honest um i wasn't planning to write this book uh i was in south africa during lockdown like we all had lot of free time um and um i was actually writing a different book i got inspired by uh people like you that we okay yes we can use our skills so i started writing a book about my adventures traveling in the northeast uh you know this whole journey like you said bang uh, the german ashram and even before that and then uh i was approached by penguin and they said you know uh, we came across your website we know about the wonderful work art of living is doing and in these challenging times it was just before the pandemic uh, they said you know would you like to write a book that could uh, inspire people to start meditating to give them an idea about how to manage their mind and uh, make them aware that all this beautiful knowledge is available i said okay well i can try hmm. so i wrote something uh, Uh, made a summary i sent it to them they loved it and then uh, before i knew it there was a book and i had sent them the first draft i was a little uh well cautious because as you know you know usually there's a lot of back and forth um, somehow they loved it so i actually asked them that are you just saying this to like keep me happy or did you actually read it they said no no it's very nice we like it so that part was easy and then uh, after the whole process was done then uh, I shared it with Gurudev of course uh, the final uh, thing he gave a quote for the cover which for me was a big blessing of course and then uh, yeah the book was published and of course we are living in a crazy time so we were still in full lockdown but then uh, it's so encouraging to see that uh, even today like people send me messages where they said oh I've read it uh, it's really helped me or it's very nice it has some stories also from my earlier life childhood and all So uh and when I shared it with Gurudev he said yeah no this can bring many more people to the path and I think today we have to like you said use all our fun and creativity to make people aware that we have this beautiful knowledge that doesn't have to be boring that is not very difficult um and that is available to spice up life or to help you deal with the challenges and uh, it's been a great adventure and of course I don't know if I can share that here but um You have really helped me at different stages where I asked you for some tips and guidance and uh, I'm so happy that it has come out so well. Uh, it has come out really well. I absolutely love uh, Swami ji's photo on the cover, no? He looks really really cool, no? Um I'm sure a lot of people are wishing he was not a swami, right? <laughs> <laughs> shiva shiva shiva. <laughs> <laughs> so, um uh, tell me the three big things that people would get by reading this book. Okay. So I think for people who are totally new they may not have done any art of living course they have not dabbled much with meditation it will give them a beautiful introduction to meditation what is the concept uh, if you want to go about uh, trying it how to go about it and uh, to give you a foundation to I would say make a well informed uh, decision also like we are not saying that okay you should only do the art of living course because people may be practicing different things but there are definitely certain pointers where you can say that yes okay you're doing proper meditation and not just a one minute app where they you know play some nature sounds or uh, a simple mindfulness exercise each of those have their specific benefits but it's not the same as real meditation which you know all about right um that is for totally new people i would say for people who are uh, have started meditation but they're facing some challenges 
where they say, oh, you know, it's difficult to be regular. You know, I know I should do it, but how to do it? How to find the time? You know, there are practical exercises, how to uh, make it a part of your life. Or maybe you trying very earnestly, very sincerely, but you're getting stuck at many times, okay, so many thoughts or uh, body is not feeling comfortable. So some practical tips and uh, valuable lessons that I've learned over the years of spending time with our master, Gurudev Shri Shri Shankarji, where sometimes, uh, you know how it goes, sometimes in the middle of a public satsang or uh, a private gathering or somewhere, he may say this one line and you say, oh yes, I got it. Or he gives you an experience and think, oh, this is something very valuable, very useful. So there are these pointers that I have shared of my last 15 years of experience uh, teaching various programs, uh, my 20 years with the art of living. And then uh, the third thing I would say is that for people who um, want to explore a little more, like for example, I've also gone into detail about the difference between mindfulness and meditation. So there may be people who are practicing for quite some time, but they want to understand a little bit more in the bigger context or uh, explore a little further, even for them. Uh, that is there. And of course, some nice stories about my early days, my adventures, that is also there. So, tell us about one adventure. So, one very interesting experience that is in the book, uh, and that has to so do with meditation. something which is not in the book. Okay, something which is not in the book. Okay. So, once it happened in, uh, it was in Uganda. I was traveling in Africa about two years back, and they asked me to conduct a program in a high security prison and a uh, lot of hassle, but then it's Africa, so there is a way to deal with the hassle. And then uh, I found out it is a women prison. <laughs> so I got there and then we had to get all these people, you know, into one room, um, anyway difficult. And then uh, people started saying, oh, Jesus, it's Jesus. <laughs> so, so at least some attraction. So we got them there, but then how do you get people to close their eyes? Because these people, they're so used to keeping their guard up you know, because maybe they did something very naughty or uh, there are other dodgy people there. So to get them to sit peacefully, to get sit still was a, was a big challenge. But then despite all the distractions, because then you have a guard who will say, okay, you know, we have to be here. We cannot close our eyes and they will keep doing something or the other and making noise. So then in between all of that, still to see that we can give people a glimpse of, of meditation and they get a glimpse that, oh yes, there is still a part of me which, is, which can be relaxed, which can be peaceful. Uh, that is something very precious and it doesn't make it easy. And I really felt, you know, just going there once, you know, what difference does it make? But then uh, I found out still now regularly we have some sessions there, someone is going at least. Um, but for me, that is something that, uh, uh, whether it was with militants in the Northeast, you know, in some jungle somewhere, Gurudev has given us these tools in, in such a way that it's, so easy to package for people to consume. And at the same time, he still gives them an authentic experience. And that is one thing in the book also, which I've mentioned again and again, that if you have a living master and an uh, opportunity to meditate in his presence or learn from him, that is something you cannot compare to anything else. Absolutely. So people may have been very sincerely practicing and having great experience, but still then I would like to invite them also that this is something when a master is here, don't miss it. You know, It's a whole different level. So, if militants and, uh, you know, notorious women <laughs> can actually learn to meditate and experience its benefits, then I think it should be doable by almost anybody on the planet, right? Definitely. And in South Africa, I had an experience. Unfortunately, this person is no more. I came to know he passed away last year. But I came to know about one gentleman who, uh, his name was Freddy, and he actually uh, lived to be, I think, around 116. So he was probably the oldest man alive. Uh, it's difficult to verify because you know, people don't have papers. But I read about it uh, in the Washington Post article someone had sent me. That no, there's this dude in South Africa and he's very old, you should meet him. And very simple guy, very humble background. So he was living in a very dodgy area. <laughs> there's a lot of gang violence and all of that. But I took uh, one of our teachers, one of our volunteers. We found out uh, the number of his wife who was in her late 80s, so she was much younger. But uh, despite their age difference, they hooked up, they got together, they got married. And uh, we said, you know, we would love to meet him. Is it okay? And he said, yes, of course. And then she said, you know, can you maybe bring some groceries also? Because they're very poor people. And uh, so we asked him, what does he like? Like, what are some of his favorite things? So we got like some 
typical, like it's not fancy at all, like a local bread, which has probably been there for the last hundred years. So very cheap, probably not healthy at all, but it's one of his favorites. So we got him all these kind of things and we went there. And then we met this gentleman and he could still walk, um, not run as much. He said he, they used to dance. So they actually met at a, at a local like dance and he was a great dancer. So that's how they got introduced. But uh, he had all his teeth, his eyes were fine. His hearing was a little less, but uh, so we spent some time and he only spoke the local language, Afrikaans, like a mm. kind of Dutch, but old dialect type. So one person I brought spoke that as well. And we had a chat and he didn't know anything what yoga is or about meditation, but we explained a little and we asked him, would you like to experience? So he said, yes, why not? You know, something new. So he and his wife and one of their children. And um, we did, a, I, I led them through a guided meditation. Um, and afterward, it really took some time for him to come out. So first we thought maybe he slept off because, you know, his hearing was also not so great. So we had to shout a few times that, okay, you can open your eyes again. <laughs> He's still okay. But then he opened his eyes and he said, oh, it feels so nice. I feel so, so free. So, uh, and his wife actually asked, she said, you, when can you come again? I would like to call a few more people. So for me, that was another level of eye opener where someone at his age, if he is still open, because it's, it's very broad minded, not open to explore something like this and, and has such a, an experience of meditation, then definitely this for everybody. Absolutely. So, <clears throat> What was your biggest challenge in writing this book? I think for me, um, I mean, I've, I've been a journalist for a while when I was in university uh, back in Holland. I used to write some popular science articles. Uh, then sometimes I used to write a blog. Uh, otherwise, I've not done any big writing as such. And even though I had started on that other book I mentioned, but then it is still, uh, it was just penning down whatever comes to mind. Like you think, oh, this is a nice story. Let me write it down. And now there is a book that I have to write, uh, some structure. They said, okay, this is the topic. I proposed some of the things that could be part of it. They said, okay, yes, nice. But I hadn't done any research. Uh, it was not something that I had planned. And then I was thinking, okay, there's two ways to go about it. Either I can start doing a lot of research or I can just go with the flow, see what happens. So I used to sit and think, okay, what could I write in this chapter? And I'll sit for maybe one, one and a half hours, write down some ideas or write a part of it. And my mind would go blank. Then I said, okay, anyway, we have our courses, online <laughs> sessions, stuff like that. So I said, okay, in the evening again, I'll try, put a nice cup of tea, put some nice music. Uh, so that I used to do, you know, create a little bit of atmosphere, switch off my phone. Okay, what else can I write? And again, I will write for maybe half an hour, one hour, and again, blank. And sometimes I would get really worried that, you know, I have no idea what else to put in this chapter. <laughs> like, I, I don't have any idea. And then again, next morning, I said, okay, let me just forget that I don't know and see if something comes. And like this, every week I would write one chapter. And I'll be very honest, even though that happened with the first, second, third chapter, till the end of the last chapter, I still got worried because I didn't know what to put in the chapter. So <laughs> I'll have some idea, I'll write a little bit, but then it's like, okay, you have to at least hit a certain number of words. But um, it still amazes me and uh, it's not happened much with other stuff. So I take it as a, as a blessing <laughs> from my master or the cosmos that, okay, you can write this book. But uh, that's been a very interesting experience, but it was a little stressful sometimes because <laughs> I really didn't know. I mean, I put a title that this is the chapter, this is what it's going to be about, but I have no idea what to write. <laughs> So maybe you should write a book about how to write a book when you don't know what to write. <laughs> maybe, yes. <laughs> well, yeah, I have no idea what to write. To write a book, <laughs> yes. even though you didn't know what you're going to yes. write. Yes, and people to, seem to like it. Yeah. It is a nice book. Yeah. It is a nice book. So, so folks, this book is available on Amazon. Uh, you can order it. You can read it. And uh, Swamiji is very, very active on Instagram, Facebook, you know, all social media. He's extremely approachable. Uh, you know, you ping him some questions, you are you bound to get some answers, sometimes very cheeky. Definitely. Uh, so, <laughs> okay. So, uh, uh, definitely follow him on Instagram, get the book, read it and uh, drop in some reviews, let him know and definitely get him to write that next book about how to write when you don't know what to write and yet you have to write. Jai Gurdhaya. You're talking about Swamiji's book, Looking Inward. One question, Swamiji. Uh, this book, looking outwards, how many countries have this been written in? 
Um, well, I started in Ghana because uh, very last minute Gurudev sent me there. He said uh, that I'm going to go there so you can go and prepare. So he shipped me off right after Shivaratri that year. And then a uh, few weeks later, initially, you know, you go around, run around to get things organized in between, had a little time. So that is when this uh, project started. Then suddenly had to rush to South Africa because lockdown happened and Ghana, we don't have much. So I didn't want to be locked there. <laughs> Went to South Africa. Then I wrote the book there in different places. Some of it in Cape Town, some of it in Johannesburg. I actually started the first chapter in this beautiful resort. I don't know if I should say that. But uh, a friend of mine said, you know, you've been locked in the same apartment for six months. Things were opening up a little. He said, there's this beautiful resort uh, near a place called God's Window. Beautiful mountains. And he said, you know, it's a perfect place to start writing your book. And there was this cabin and there's a small stream down there. Uh, so in the morning, they'll bring a breakfast with super, not like nice fruits, very tasty, looks very elegant. And I would sit there uh, and have this nice, comfortable chair. And I thought, okay, let me just start writing. So I started there actually. And then finally, after coming back to India, uh, some of the final editing and, uh, you know, the cover, all these things were done here. So we can say uh, at least three countries, two continents. But the stories are from all over the world, obviously. Yes, yes. So it has some of my stories from different parts in Africa, in Europe, uh, back in the Netherlands, yes. you know, where I grew up, of course. And, um, and of course, India. So that would have been another nice... Uh Title for the book, God's Window, <laughs> where it all began. <laughs> Actually, yes, yes. Maybe, who knows, a sequel one day. <laughs> nice. So, Swamiji, you are in your talks and in your courses, in your programs, you always bring the lightness and the jovial aspect of life. Mm -hmm. You're always very funny. Uh, so, is this journey of looking inwards also uh, light or is it serious? I have really done my best to make it light because as we know there are plenty of serious books out there. Uh, life is serious enough, it is problematic enough and I have seen that uh, still many people also think meditation is something very serious, uh, not in a positive way. That either you have to be very old or bored with life or, or if, yeah, a lot of discipline or, or leave everything and go to sit in a cave. So um, I have done my best um, and from what I've heard it has kind of worked to keep it uh, in our style, you know, where it's approachable. See how Gurudev has taught us. He's, he's the one where we've learned it. So we've learned from him. He's not very serious. So very profound uh, truths, but then in a, in a way that it's easily digestible. And um, actually, you know, just today again, someone called me and they said, you know, I was reading the book and it feels like you're standing in front of me. Like it's, it's really your language. So I'm, I'm glad they didn't edit it much. But, uh, but yeah, I've tried to make it uh, very approachable. At the same time, sharing some very valuable things that I've learned over the years, because uh, we don't have to reinvent the wheel. You know, we have like, uh, we have had the fortune, uh, you also, to spend a lot of time with Gurudev. And sometimes there's these things he shares where you feel, oh, wow, you know, and this is a chance for us to share some of those things with people as well. So this book is really written in such a conversational style with stories and anecdotes and wisdom in action. Uh, and of course, a way to look inwards to meditate, uh, which of course makes a huge difference to who we are and what we do. So really, thank you for this. My pleasure. Who is it difficult for to look inward? I think one of the biggest challenges is that, uh, especially I think in today's world, of course, you know, I was born in 1984. Uh, I don't remember all my past lives, so I don't remember how it was 100, 200, 300 years ago. But if you see, I do remember a little bit, <laughs> but if you see, nowadays from very young, we are encouraged to uh, want more, to achieve big things, to go and do so many things, see so many things. Um, and in one way, of course, it's, it's wonderful that we get to see so much of the world. You know, people who would grow up in a village may dream of going to the city. But here, even if you're sitting in a village, you will see uh, United States, you will see Europe, you will see all parts of India. And definitely you may feel like wanting to go there. It looks so much more awesome than your village. So we have all these dreams, um, these desires, this passion is kindled. But then if we don't learn how to also take a step back and, and get centered again, then what happens, it leaves us in a, in a space where 
you may never be really comfortable or happy or at peace where you are. And I think uh, in today's world, this is a big challenge where um, we want to do so many things. We want to multitask everything. And then you're trying to also multitask your rest, maybe your family time, everything you're, you're eating, you're sleeping, but it doesn't work. And in the end, why we want all these things is because you want to be happy. So we think, okay, this is going to make me happy. But then how to regain that, uh, that peace, that, that, uh, yeah, that inner peace and that sense of freedom, that only comes when you look inward. And of course, this Gurudev has been teaching us and people all over the world. But I think now more than ever, it is so badly needed that people have access to this knowledge. And of course, uh, to some extent, it is available on YouTube everywhere. But then, um, as Gurudev told us during the lockdown, no, use your skills, your creativity. We have to reach many more people. And he said, those who can write, write a book. I thought, okay, well, I know how to write a little bit. Let's see. And it may be one more way where someone on, a, on an airport may pick it up or in a bookstore, or maybe someone who did a course once, but was not so regular, who was struggling to really get into the practice, may get inspired, may find some practical tools and exercises to, you know, get going again. And I think when people have the tools to regain that stability, that inner peace or that, because um, these were crazy times, you know, everybody's struggling that can again empower them also to say, oh yes, this is something we want to share with people. You know, this is something, I have experienced this works. So now we need all the ambassadors we can get to get people to meditate. And I really hope that this can contribute in that uh, effort of our master. Sure. And as Gurudev said, uh, we need to share our skills. One of your skills is chanting. You yes. do it so beautifully and uh, people on the social media sites and internet and YouTube and I love to hear you chant. Is there a connection between mindful chanting and meditation? Definitely, in the sense if we look at the scriptures they define mantra, no? because when we chant we, we chant mantras. So they define mantra as that which can take you beyond the mind. No? Manana traiti iti mantra. So mantra is that which takes you beyond the mind. And that is why we see in many traditions, whether it is, of course, in the Vedic tradition, whether it is in the Buddhist tradition and many traditions around the world. Uh, mantra is one of those tools that can help us to, to transcend. It can help us to meditate. I would say mantra is one of the tools like Gurudev has given us uh, many. We have the breathing techniques, you know, we have mantras um, to come to that point where you can go beyond the thinking mind and really experience your your true nature, how you, where you are so peaceful, where you're so still, where you really recharge. And um, that's why in this book I've shared some of those uh, practical tips for people who may have been meditating already, but uh, maybe how to improve their meditation practice, how to go a little deeper. Uh, they're struggling with specific things, how to overcome that. With your Dutch origins and your European looks, you can still speak Hindi so well and Sanskrit. So have there been any funny incidents where people were shocked to hear you speak <laughs> many times <laughs> um, and uh, sometimes even I got a little shocked uh, many times it used to happen that and still happens where people may not be aware that I speak Hindi or a little bit of some other local languages here so I remember uh, the Northeast I, I traveled a lot there for six seven years and many times I would call a taxi to go to maybe to the airport or somewhere an Uber and the guy will be sitting in front and then when he reaches there, he sees that, okay, I'm the passenger, so I get in. And then he starts to drive and he realizes that I was the one he spoke to on the phone. But then, <laughs> so two, three times he will just look, look back like this and then in the rear view mirror, he will just see. And, uh, sir, ek baat puchu. I'm going to ask something. I said, yeah, of course you ask. Hindi <laughs> bolta? Like, how come? You know, you look like a foreigner, but how come you speak Hindi? So then sometimes I'll speak a little bit of Assamese also. He gets an even bigger shock. <laughs> but, uh, and once it happened in the, in the airport that I was uh, also in Guwahati, I think, in Assam. We were standing in line for the security check. And uh, I was speaking in Hindi to the, the person who was checking the luggage because I had my puja kit and you know, a lot of silver sharp items and all that. So I had to explain that a little. So a guy in Canada tells his friend, another businessman, I don't look at this guy, you know, he speaks proper Hindi. So then I told him that I speak a little bit in Canada, also in Canada. And the guy, he got, got a shock. He's like, you know, like not safe anywhere. 
<laughs> but uh, yeah, it's many interesting experiences. But uh, at the same time, I realized I've spent so much time in India and I got so used to the accent. And especially initially, um, I found that uh, I realized that speaking with a little bit of an Indian accent is much easier for people to understand when I was traveling in Northeast because they may not be so used to, uh, to English and I didn't speak proper Hindi yet. So it's like, you know, meet them halfway. But it's been so many years now that when I go back to Europe, uh, my Dutch is still okay. <laughs> but in English, it's become so Indian that now I have to really consciously, you know, mind my language that I don't throw a few Hindi words in between or... <laughs> so it's so a challenge any, both ways. Are there any plans to make the book into Hindi or any other Kannada? <laughs> so <language>? Kannada, I don't know. <laughs> Hindi, actually, it is being translated. Oh. Uh, a friend of mine told me that a friend of his told a friend of his that uh, he really liked the book and he said this should be available in Hindi. Mm. And that person was, uh, he's actually the head of one of the biggest Hindi publishing houses. Mm -hmm. So he called me, he said, you know, you wrote a very nice book and uh, I've met uh, your master, Shishi Ravi Shankarji, so many years ago. Uh, we published some of his books in Hindi mm. and we would really like to publish it in Hindi. I said, well, very nice, go ahead. <laughs> so that is going on apparently. Um, Canada, I have no plans, <laughs> but who knows one day. Yes. Similarly, somebody who who had enjoyed the English version mm. and who can understand the language, they may come forward and say. Yes. What is the language of the, our inside? Though there are 7,000 languages in the world. Mm. I think the beauty is that uh, to really go inside, we have to go beyond language. And I think that is where also if you look at, you know, people and you know, maybe even better than me, that we have people uh, who got so connected to Gurudev, you know, to this knowledge, who may be from uh, a place like Russia or Mongolia or, or Argentina, and they may not understand the word he says in the sense that they don't speak English or Hindi or any language he speaks, but they feel so connected. And... I have experienced myself also that, you know, when we travel, you conduct programs. Some places, yes, we have to get a translator because we don't speak the local language. But the moment you sit with people and you meditate with them, you uh, share some time with them where you have gone beyond that mind, that thinking mind, beyond words, beyond language, that creates a kind of belongingness that, uh, that is a whole different level. And uh, till today, it's and I'm sure it will remain like this, it's so humbling to see that that way you can get connected to people without even having to speak a word or without understanding a word they're saying. And just like it connects us to others, it also connects us to ourselves. And I think in today's world where so many people are struggling to figure out that what I want to do with my life, you know, many people don't know, young people also. I don't know really what I want to do. I don't know what is the purpose of my life or where I want to go in my life or why I am here these answers you will not get on Google, you know. So the moment we connect more to ourselves, we get the answers to those questions. And it may not be in, in our language, but that can give you a kind of confidence, uh, a kind of, yeah, I would say familiarity with yourself that will allow you to be at home wherever you go. And um, I think today more than anything, this is what people need to learn. No? The rest is easily available, but... Beautiful. Beautiful. So, here's looking inwards with Swamiji and through this book, through lots of people meditating and looking inwards, we get to the essence of who we are, beyond words and the peace and the love that uh, this book is creating all over. Thank you, Swamiji. <laughs>